Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome this afternoon. I will be hosting two panel debates regarding two issues of utmost importance in Europe, and the first is indeed the future of work in Europe. As we all know, this issue is changing rapidly at a dramatic pace. Things like a long life career seems to be something of the past. People are worried about their economical future. President Dole already mentioned it in his uh, speech a couple of minutes ago. And at the same time, we see new developments like the digitization, the robotization of jobs. Is this going to devastate our jobs? Or on the contrary, are here to be seen new opportunities to create a new kind of jobs, a new kind of skills? As has been said already, challenges that's also a part of the future. And we have a very distinguished panel, if I may them, introduce them to you on the floor, which you all know. We have here Doris Pack of the EPP Women. We have uh, Ben Benson of uh, the Small and Medium Entrepreneurs of Europe. We have from the YEP, the youth of uh, the party, Konstantinos Kiranakis, and of course Elmar Brock of the European Union of Christian Dem Dem Democratic Workers. The first question to you all is, of course, this problem, as some say, it, of digitization, digitalization, automatization of jobs. Is this something that we should stop, try to stop, or is that something that we should try to embrace? And I think a lot of workers will be, Mr. Brock, worried about, is, going, is, is the robot, as I, robot as I say, going to take over our jobs? What is your opinion? No, I think uh, that this is one of the reasons which populists uh, try to exploit. That because of this technological development, many people in a medium-sized business and workers are afraid of it. But to stop it would be the end of everything. You can never stop technological development. And if we do it, others will not do it, and then we are behind and lose jobs. So therefore, we have to take that on board, we have to do it in the right way, we have to look in our social systems, including the problems why, because of the demographic changes, uh, that uh, people can be employed, under which conditions they are employed, that it's uh, under socially orientated conditions are employed, and that we see what we have written in the Treaty of Lisbon, our constitution, that the social market economy is the com economy of competitiveness and social balance. That does not mean uh, that we have changed now toward more uh, social policy, but we have to do it in a different way. Uh, and I believe that we will not lose jobs when we do it uh, in a proper way. Always it was said, when you had new technological developments, there will be less jobs. At the end, it were other jobs that came up. That means that we have to prepare for that. That means a proper vocational training, which is closer to the needs of the labor market as it is until now in many of our member countries where the educational system has nothing to do with the needs of the labor market. And if we have here a change and Europe can be supportive of that, then it might be help to overcome also youth unemployment, which is a real threat for our societies. What kind of policies can accompany this uh, transition that you mentioned? So you should clearly say, let's try to embrace it, but what kind of policies do we do we need to put in place what kind of skills do people need to develop in order to follow this evolution? Ms. Ms. Yeah, first of all, we have to find out that uh, the education is the alpha and omega everywhere. If we have to give the kids the education they need to get really a job in this new situation, they have to start early, in the early school time until the university. I think the digitalization, the entrepreneurship should have been learned in school time. It is possible. We should give the kids all the possibilities. And I just mentioned that it's not only a question of kids, it is also the question of adult education, of adult people. We have to give them a chance, the adult people, at, get, at least to get accustomed to the new technologies. We have to help them in all the levels of their ages. It means at 14, 15, 60 even. So I think this is something which we keep in mind, and everybody knows it. We have a lot of possibilities in other Adult, in adult education, and I spoke of education in general. I think we have in the European Union such a high imp important program, Erasmus+, which is keeping together 
kids and universities and apprenticeship and adult learning and youth in voluntary service. This gives people a possibility to be acquainted to the others, to learn from each other, to be mobile, and to feel themselves well in the new world which is globalized. And let me just add one thing. We should not forget the women. It is high time that women with their high quality, with their capacity, even especially in digitalization, and all these things, they should be really have a place everywhere. And therefore, I think we should also not only ask policy, we should also ask the business world to make this possible for everybody, for men and women to take part in jobs and they can com combine jobs and family life. This is what our society needs and therefore we need flexibility on behalf of childcare, on behalf of elderly help. So I think a lot to do on the political scene, but also on the business, on the business scene. Side. This is clearly an appeal to you, Mr. Benson. We have, uh, we have clearly the, a policy, an advocacy of a policy of, if I may say so, uh, lifelong learning. Policymakers should, should address it, but also the business world. Are they doing it and are they ready for that? First of all, I think it's uh, very, very important to understand that if Europe shall compete in the world market in the future. We need to get more values in our products. We need to get more values in all our services. And therefore, we shall embrace and encourage robotization, digitalization, etc. We know that the SMEs are creating most jobs in Europe. They will continue to do that. And these new uh, uh, skills, uh, we, we, I fully agree with Doris when she says that we need to prepare our youth uh, for the future for, for better education. But, but what's needed is that we need to create a healthy business climate for our SMEs. We know that uh, they need financing. We know that they also need um, that we are combating red tape as politicians. And, and therefore, we also create access to the markets. What I see for the future is that we have, for the last decade, been speaking about all outsourcing from Europe to production in China and other countries far away. I think we will see a future where we will insource a lot of European industry production for the next decade. Provided we are ready bon, with si the vous right permettez, people on the skills. Si vous permettez, c'est impossible de, de continuer le débat comme ça. Je comprends que vous ayez beaucoup de discussions entre vous, mais je vous demande de sortir. S'il vous plaît, ceux qui ne veulent pas écouter, ce n'est pas un problème, mais c'est à l'extérieur que se passent les discussions, parce qu'il y a d'autres qui veulent écouter. Thank you for the, thank you for the courtesy, Mr. President. Thank you for the courtesy, ladies and gentlemen. I see that uh, some kind of discipline in this part is, uh, is being addressed. Thank you very much. I come to, uh, to YEP, of course. Uh, we have been hearing, uh, uh, the women we have been hearing about uh, the, trade, the trade union uh, standpoint and the small and uh, uh, medium enterprises. What about, uh, what about the youth? How are they addressing this thing? I think you embrace it. I think you don't have a problem at all with this. Of course we embrace it. And as politicians, I think it would be totally wrong uh, to try to stop something that uh, is part of the uh, total evolution of things. But let me start by mentioning an example to see um, why all these things that we're discussing are, are not in the far future, but in the very near future. In 1997, uh, I'm sure uh, most of us remember a company called Kodak. And Kodak used to employ 170,000 employees and used to hold more than 85% of the global share of an industry called uh, photo paper. But then the industry, because we all hold these devices called smartphones and because of other reasons, disappeared. So the company went bankrupt and the whole industry disappeared. And there are plenty of examples um, like the one and like the thing that happened to Kodak that will happen to many industries in the next 10 years. So the only answer to evolution and to digitalization and robotization that is a real threat to the, job, to the jobs that exist today and according to research, more than 70% of the jobs that exist today in the next 20 years will completely disappear, is education. And by education, I mean 
uh, of course I agree with what Doris Park said. We need to teach our children how to do things more than to teach them how to read things. The employer of the future and the employer of the present to a very large extent asks people, and especially young people, how they can do things, how they can fix things, how they can take a problem from point A and solve it by taking it to point B. These are the skills that we need to ask young people um, to acquire, and this is the education model that we need to build as European politicians. Yeah. I would like to come back to an issue that uh, Ms. Pack has addressed, of course. She had briefly spoken about it, women. Since uh, we've been discussing this in Dublin, in the Congress in Dublin, in Madrid, and now again, over and over, this has to be addressed. Women are still not treated in an equal way on the labor market. Gentlemen, what kind of policies should be put in place to be able to say in a couple of years' time to Miss Peck, the problem is solved? Listen, there will be force because there will be needed the women. There needs the women. We have a demographic situation where there needs the women. That's it. And they are forced to do it, even if they don't want it. Please keep in mind what I said. In five years' time, you will see that it is like this. Gentlemen? <laughs> if I can say something. Uh, I remember in Dublin we had this slogan, believe in people. I think as politicians what we need to do is champion women that succeed. Perhaps a slogan, believe in women, would be more suitable for a campaign like this. We need as politicians to believe in women. And we need as politicians to believe in women. Why? Because we see successful examples of women in companies and in politics that can do much better than men, that can do much better than anything we could expect when these stereotypes used to be more popular. So I think as politicians we cannot regulate. I don't believe personally in the solution of quotas. But what we can do is you champion... You don't believe in, in positive discrimination? Like, like I don't believe in positive discrimination, but I do believe that as politicians we can champion examples of successful women in politics and in business that can inspire the younger generations. Mr. Benson? I really think that more flexibility is needed. I come from the Nordic area where the employers make the, the decisions together with the employees, but with two grown-up daughters, small children, both of them want a career in, in private life. I really see that flexibility, one of the best words for the women, so they can have a career but also take care of their family. Mr. Brock? I think there's already a change, I think, from generation to generation. As my generation dealt with these questions within the family, it's totally different to that what my children do. And I hope that it goes forward. They share much more of the responsibility of that, what has to be done together for the family, that not uh, uh, the woman has to do everything. The second point is, uh, and I think it's very important, to create a, uh, the educational and social balance around. Still, children go come from the women. And some employers still say, oh, not in that age, employ them, they will be not for a year there. And here we have to create systems within a career to help them that this is not a disadvantage. And we have to build now with, uh, uh, that uh, we can look after the children in a better way, that women can work with a good conscience despite they have children. Here, we have had a great pro progress in the last 10 years, at least in my country, but it's not enough yet. And here we have to do much more so that these natural disadvantages, if I can call it in brackets that way, can be overcome that women have the same chance on the labor market in their career as men have. I think that's it. Exactly. I have three children, two daughters of them. So I'm on the side of a woman in this question. Yes, yes. <laughs> Miss Peck, I think, yeah. I think if, if, all, if all men were talking yeah. and acting yeah. like these three gentlemen, the problem no, would be I, solved. I like it. If they are representing really most of the men sitting in this hall, I would be very happy. Because I think they are... So. But they you don't think so. Come on. But you don't think so that they no, are. No, I don't think so. So <laughs> I'm, I'm realistic, you know. I'm a long time in politics that I know whom I meet. So I think uh, I'm very hopeful that the time will come that much more men will speak as you did it, you three. Thank you very much. But I think they will also be forced. But I want, want to underline our society needs men and women in profession and in 
family. So this means we need really much more flexibility for both, not only for women, please keep in mind, for both, and this is important, and business should understand it. I think Mrs. Park will be very happy to hear that in the next YEP Congress, the majority of candidates are women. Wonderful. You will make sure of that. <laughs> yes. you the post? To, end, to end this debate, uh, let's address the social question. We hear uh, Mr. Juncker, for instance, talk a lot about social, a social Europe. Clearly, uh, the problems that, that we're facing will need some kind of reform on the social level. Is this something that um, your party, that, that Europe and that the European Parliament and your, uh, your delegates should address, or is this something that we rather should leave up to the, the nation states. Mr. Benson. I, th I, I think it's okay that we now discuss uh, our social system uh, when we, at the same time, discussing globalization, uh, robotization, etc. But first of all, we have to conclude that, of course, new things create old, uh, uh, as that, uh, for example, the internet have killed a lot of jobs, but it has created much more jobs. So what we will see in the future is that we can create more jobs instead of discussing. But of course, there's a lot of people who lose their jobs. And therefore, the key word is, and uh, how we crack the nut is, is, it is education. We have to educate them all the time, all the way around, uh, instead of discussing our social systems. Our social system are very, very diverse in our member countries. I think we can inspire each other, but to make the same social benefits all over Europe, that it's both It's not a good idea in your, in no. your point of view, Ms. Pack. But I think we, we should not harmonize. It's not possible no, no. to harmonize it. But what we should stick on, it is a social market system. This is something which is really a, a kind of Europe. It has started in Germany, but I think it is the best, the best manner to run business and to run a society. Social market system. And this can be done in each of our countries in different forms, but it should be the basis of everything. Only in a social market system, you have dialogue between employers and employees. So I think this is the, the basis of everything, and I hope very much that nobody who thinks on Europe is thinking that we should or we could harmonize all, all systems, social systems. It's not possible. They have been achieved in long times between syndicates and, and, and businessmen, so I think this is something which should be also told to our people, they should not hope that EU is doing everything. Not everything can be done from the buff. Mr. Block? Yes, I think uh, social market economy is our brand. We are against Manchester liberalism, we are against socialism. But it means that we have uh, adapted to the new situation. If you have totally different jobs in the future, then you will see that a certain type of social protection is also created for such jobs. Uh, this is, does not mean to have more money for social policy automatically. And I believe here we have to do something. If we do not create a certain social protection system, who will pay the pensions for when the people come uh, older? We have to look into that situation. And therefore, it, uh, it's not just a competitive of today. It's a question of social financing at the end of the day, and how that has to be discussed. And that I agree with uh, Doris. We cannot do that in the same way in every member country, especially if you know it goes an amount of money. Therefore, it's in the Treaty of Lisbon written that for social security schemes you need anonymity, that we cannot harmonize that uh, in the European Union, but we have to look in a certain line of social protection. We have to look in a certain line of social justice in the European Union. We can keep the European Union only together if there is the feeling that this Europe is not just for competitiveness, and it's also for social balance. Otherwise, these people will left-wing or go to populist. Many programs of the populist are not right one. It's very leftist arguments, therefore workers go to them, and here we have to find within our framework of the social market economy a right way of protection also for the jobs in the future. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And, and yourself, thank you for listening to us and give these people a warm round of applause for their efforts. Thank you. <laughs>